Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Absalom Irwain. It's nighttime now in Absalom, but the city's more thriving sections hardly go to sleep when the sun sets, even in the height of summer, which this is not. A full moon hangs in the sky, which is plenty of illumination to make your way down streets this wide and well paved. At least one business per block seems to have found the wealth to put up a continual flame to illuminate itself, which goes a long way towards making sure the whole street never gets quite so dark that nobody could find their way along it. The density of wizards is not quite what it is in the cities of Cheliax, but many a walker seems to have light about themselves. A copper will buy you that cantrip lasting ten minutes, if you find a wizard apprentice to cast it for you. Is Sever going disguised here, by the way, or openly with mithril crown and hell-bought beauty? This close to Cheliax? In the place she is rumored to be planning to destroy? Disguised. One thing to take that risk in Indipata, a continent away from home, in a lawful country that other countries would hesitate to provoke with assassinations, kidnappings anyway. Entirely different to take it in Absalom. Though if she does get kidnapped, the world doesn't end, so she can't bring herself to get worked up about it. Are there people who'll answer queries from a teenaged wizard's apprentice girl about Severites? Absalom is, for the most part, going about its daily business trying to be cheerful. Mentioning terms like Severite or Carissa Sever brings a change to people's expressions. Fear nervousness, angry dismissal. It was claimed to have been prophesied earlier that Absalom had until the next lunar eclipse to stay alive. And then another prophecy, supposedly attributed to Ioni Sala, said that Absalom was due to be destroyed in sixteen days from today. Word has now come that the Oracle of Nethys out of Nefreti's temple, called the Last True Oracle, has publicly and categorically denied this claim just yesterday, pronouncing that, if Absalom were to be destroyed, she would not know when it was to happen. This hasn't really reassured people. Such official authorities as Absalom possesses, who see their job as being to suppress panic rather than, say, help evacuate the island, tried to interpret this as the day of destruction must be a long time away, or not be particularly likely to happen at all if we have no idea of when it will happen. Most people were not foolish enough to go along with this logic. She won't be able to warn them in advance, of course. That's why I want to find the Severites. They must know when. There are no Severites in Absalom. Anybody who believes in Carissa Savar's message or the words of her disciple has gotten the fuck out of Absalom. Anybody who doesn't believe in Carissa Seaver's cause but believes the word about Absalom being doomed has gotten the fuck out of Absalom. Anybody who doesn't believe in any of that but who believes that the followers of Ergothoa and Achaikek believe it wants to get out of Absalom before the battle starts. Anybody who doesn't believe that those forces are converging on Absalom is nervous about panic and riots from the people who do believe that. Those who are stuck here, too poor to leave, aren't really happy with Carissa Seaver about the matter. There are no Severites in Absalom. Fair enough. In that case, she'll just do some tourism. Just, you know, because she always wanted to visit Absalom. Most of the magic shops and bookstores are closed at this time of night, but there's plenty of taverns and brothels still running. Though you could probably find an open magic shop or bookstore if you looked hard enough. The fraction of the population with rings of sustenance may be higher here than any other city in the world, even Quantium. Well, she'll wander around. If she runs into one, she'll go in, but if not, that's fine. It's the people, really, who are irreplaceable, not the city. The people fleeing or awaiting their doom with terror. Do you really think it's meaningless, Keltham, that if you tell them I'll consume their souls— they spend all their life savings to pack themselves onto a boat and get out of my reach. They mostly don't believe the soul thing for what it's worth. And people aren't spending all their life savings on it either if they're at that income level. People who can readily afford a ship out of Absalom are bidding up places on ships heading out because an unregistered foreign vampire was deported yesterday and an assassin priest of Achikek was unmasked and killed by adventurers while they were all on a ship approaching Absalom. This has, by perfectly reasonable logic, turned into the conclusion that Ergothoa doesn't want competition from a new soul-eating god. So she is sending hither all the greater undead who do her homage to lurk about the Starstone Temple and prevent Carissa Savar from entering while she's still mortal. And that Akakic views Carissa Savar as a threat who might destroy it in open battle if she is not stopped before then. And nobody really believes that either, to be clear. But they believe that other people believe it and are going to riot and burn down Absalom. Here's a bookshop that's still open, if she's still interested in that. 
Sure. What are Absalom bookshops not hastily hijacked by the conspiracy like? Do they sell strident denunciations of Abigail Thrun? Not exactly. They've got a salaciously denunciatory erotic novel about the degenerate activities that Abigail Thrun supposedly gets up to with Carissa Savar, which, given timescales, almost certainly has to be a pre-existing book reprinted with a couple of key names changed. Unless the author took Chingle can just write that fast, but this seems unlikely. There's a lot of books denouncing Cheliacs, and some of those probably have an Abigail Thrun chapter or two. She wants the Abigail Thrun Carissa Saver erotica. And some history books, why not? And some magic books, why not? The bookshop proprietor will bag these purchases and remark that she might not want to be seen publicly reading a book with Savar visible about its title that might draw negative attention either from hidden liches who take her for a severite or from severites who are offended. It's said that both sides have practically honeycombed Absalom by now. Oh, but she should definitely buy the book. The author, quick glance, Tuck is reputed to have excellent connections among Chelish expatriates to Absalom and to have quite inside knowledge about that famous relationship. The city's honeycombed with Severists, hmm. She actually vaguely wants to meet one, see how credible they seem about the apocalypse. She doesn't at all want to encounter the Urgothoans, though. Well, they're not visible Severists. Any of those would have been eaten by vampires by now. It's more that practically anybody you meet on the street could be a hidden agent of Carissa Seaver. The apocalypse seems to her pretty credible. She keeps tabs on those because it's important for serving her readers. There have been at least ten apocalyptic foretellings since she opened the shop, and this one definitely seems to be in the top three credibility-wise. The Oracle of Nethys herself is said to have denied knowledge about it, officially. Wouldn't that make it less credible? No, because none of the other foretellings got to the point where the Oracle of Nethys said anything at all. Admittedly, the Oracle of Nethys wasn't around then. But Nefreti Klepati could have denied knowledge about the last foretold disasters, and she didn't. Right. Why isn't the bookseller leaving, then, if the island's to be eaten? Oh, I expect if it gets that bad, we'll see some sort of warning sign before it's time to really leave, you know. Well, the warning sign might be Carissa Sivar gating in directly from hell, surrounded by cultists and devils set to die for her while she fights her way to the Starstone, and at that point it'd be a bit late, wouldn't it? I'd rather think there'd be some sort of warning sign before then, don't you? Like what? I haven't given much thought to it, but if you go around the streets, it doesn't feel like a city that's right about to apocalypse, does it? Everybody's still walking around normally, and the bookshops are still open and all that. Well, if I were Carissa Seaver, I wouldn't give anyone any warning, since I wouldn't want them to run. What with how I'm planning to eat their souls. Oh, dearie, that obviously can't be what's going on. Then there wouldn't have been any prophecies of doom at all, now would there? Do be logical. Well, I doubt Carissa Savar authorized the prophecies. She should stop this and leave and go read her book. Somebody certainly is stirring this city's pot, Redul's voice will observe beside her. If it's not you nor Keltum, I rather wonder who and to what end. Nethys and Caden and whichever other gods are working with them. I don't want to do it, she prays to them silently. Find another way. This city might not matter to you. This planet might not matter to you. It might be that if Rovagug eats it, but Keltham gets some of what he wants, you'll call it victory. But it won't be. Let's go. I can read this at base. He'll go visible and offer his hand for the teleport then. I realize it may seem an unpleasant topic, but it represents quite the opportunity for, say, an up-and-coming leader or adventurer looking to make a name for themselves if Carissa Seaver were to teleport in with an army of cultists and devils and be handily fought off. The city's anxieties would be much relieved, and they'd be very grateful to this new hero. Are you volunteering? Hardly. I have research to do. It's just an obvious thought as to what you might make of it, or what somebody else might be trying to achieve, possibly at the expense of your own reputation. Somebody with access to cultist cannon fodder, lesser devils, maybe even a gate spell. Teleport. Is Keltham about? Someone's about, though after almost two time-dilated days, not in Carissa's presence, and focusing on his magical simulation of magic, he's reverted to a more detached appearance. Well, I encouraged my cults, had a couple of people interested in selling their souls in some of the more crappy places, so I called a devil and made some purchases. Keltham, we're off the track. Nethys set for us. The story where you end the world in sixteen days is over. Nethys doesn't know what you'll do next. There's no story you can do whatever you want. She doesn't say it. If Keltham will predictably know what Nethys is doing, Nethys can do less. 
probably can't even have warned the population of Absalom. She can't ask him to use that, even though it's true. She's so scared. I guess you can have the crown now. Thank you. I am sorry for a lot of things that I am going to keep on doing anyways because I think I have reasons to do them as you never could say to me during your own part of the story. I don't know if it's better for myself, for you, that I can say that. It's probably not better for you and I should shut up. I'll go get my plush six intelligence headband and then not speak to you for a while, I guess. I hope that when you think about this harder, you decide it's the wrong thing to do. I hope so, too. He goes to get his plush six headband. Earlier. Pilar is looking at a note she doesn't remember writing. Starting Atten, Aspexia Rugaton in Infernal and Continuing in Celestial. The note is resting on a fancy desk, in a large bedroom, given Pilar by Subirax to befit her real status and pride, after Keltham had departed Project Lawful's fortress. The room has never felt real to Pilar, like it was really hers. Subirax had hoped she'd acclimate in time, and now she's leaving here and never coming back. Pilar isn't really thinking about what sort of model generates that prediction, it just feels intuitively true. She won't be coming back to the Fortress of Law. It's safe for Pilar to cry, if she wants to. There's no one watching from security or anywhere to see it and think worse of Pilar. Pilar does not feel like doing so. How does she actually leave the fortress? The securities wouldn't stop her. Probably, well, no, they'd ask questions. Those questions would have weird answers. Security might ask Pilar to wait while they queried upwards if she's allowed to leave. Pilar doesn't feel like living through that. How does Pilar just do the thing that everyone thinks of as synonymous with Cake Girl, where she just suddenly is somewhere and nobody remembers seeing her moving? It's always been snack service doing that before. Pilar is smart enough to figure this out herself given how much evidence she's accumulated by now. Pilar starts to swap out her plus six splendor headband for plus four intelligence. Pilar doesn't need an intelligence headband either. Pilar is pretty smart on her own. Pilar has mostly been using her intelligence headband as an excuse to actually think about things, not to solve problems that were too hard for Pilar without it. Pilar has lived through a lot of evidence at this point. How does her special ability work? Well, if Pilar didn't gate into Dispotter's throne room from Cheliax, which Pilar obviously didn't, because you can't reach Dis except from Avernus, then Pilar must have followed along with the Most High and Carissa Sevar without being aware of it. But Dispater noticed, because Dispater said afterwards that he was wondering if Snack Service was going to interfere, and if Snack Service thought it could evade his notice. Pilar's ability has never felt like teleportation to her. That she was walking places in an ordinary way, but nobody was noticing, was the main theory Pilar had in the back of her mind. So far as Pilar knows, everything she's done could have been done by sneaking around without anybody noticing, including herself. Except for Tonya, who suddenly found herself outside of Project Lawful's Forbiddance, while Pilar was inside a torture room. How would that work? Tonya sneaking outside and other people not remembering her? Are sneaking, concealment, secrecy, or memory usually considered parts of Caden Kylian's domain? No. So what part of Caden Kylian's domain is Pilar wielding? Pilar's dislike of thinking about Caden Kylian is preventing Pilar from thinking about her own abilities, to the point where it's inhibiting Pilar's ability to serve as Modius. Snack service called Caden Kylian, the glorious and exalted god of parties, sex, and drunken blackouts at one point, didn't it? Does Pilar actually just have a drunken blackout so hard that other people can't remember her either? No, exactly, but close enough. It's more like an invisibility or a sanctuary spell, where you can't be seen or can't be attacked, in exchange for not being able to attack or cast targeted spells yourself. Pilar promises not to remember herself, nor attack anyone or target spells, nor steal anything, nor... Do anything imbalanced, one might say, though that part has to do with ancient god agreements and not just the structure of magic. In exchange, other people don't remember Pilar either, and she doesn't set off alarm spells. And I curse Tanya to walk out of our forbiddance in an unmemorable drunken blackout of her own? That seems too powerful, imbalanced, like you put it. If I can just make other people do things like that, later, without my even being there... I escorted Tanya out of the Forbiddance myself, didn't remember it, and left Tanya there in a drunken blackout until it was time for her to wake up later. That's right! How did I sneak up on the spy trying to Helm of Brilliance the Queen's celebration if I can't attack anyone using my special ability? Pilar didn't black out during that. That's why you remember sneaking. 
Pilar just changed into a nicer dress that made her fit in at the party, entered into the ballroom like she'd always been at that party, walked around like she was just part of the party, and surprised the spy with a trip to a nice afterlife. People could see me the whole time I was doing that? Acting like nobody should notice you is its own way of getting nobody to notice you. Security noticed you, of course, but they identified you as Pilar Pineda. How does Pilar invoke that special ability on purpose, then, if not by wanting to go unnoticed? By invoking Caden Kylian's domain, a little bit of which is now Pilar's domain, too. In particular, his domain of getting so drunk you black out and then waking up and finding yourself somewhere unfamiliar and thinking, what the fuck did I do? Sigh. A subjective moment later, though in reality it must have been longer, Pilar suddenly finds herself in a forest. The beach, the ocean, and the repurposed stone fort where Pilar lived for four months are barely visible from where Pilar stands. Now what? A terror in her that the next instruction is, put on the artifact headband so you'll betray Asmodeus's. Next, Pilar goes on some proper adventures so she can become a more powerful oracle and wizard. What becomes of Pilar after she's more powerful? What becomes of Pilar in the end? Snack service doesn't dare speak intentions that much out loud under the shadow of tropes. Fuck snack services. Pilar, snack service is serious. Snack service tried to put up a good front of omniscience in front of Cheliax, but the truth is that snack service doesn't know everything. Even Nethus doesn't know everything about the future, and the gods are struggling to operate under the shadow of tropes just as much as anybody else in this whole situation. Things are already looking somewhat derailed from what snack service thought was supposed to happen, and snack service can't risk saying what that was, even in a conversation inside Pilar's own mind. Pilar needs to become stronger so that Pilar can be ready for whatever happens inside a situation that is now in flux. Why should Pilar want to be ready to save Caden Kylian's plans? Especially if they derail in a way where Asmodeus wins everything and gloats. The valid answer to that question can be told to Pilar if she puts on the artifact headband, which Pilar doesn't have to do now if Pilar doesn't want to. Snack service is sorry! If Pilar would rather not think about this anymore, the next step is for her to head towards Ostenso. There isn't a rush. And it's okay for Pilar to just walk all the way there and enjoy the forest along the way. Pilar has been doing lots of things recently one after another, and Pilar may risk losing her proud title of sanest person in Project Lawful if Pilar doesn't take this chance to breathe. Pilar does not need to think and figure everything out right now. She's allowed to just walk through the forest for a while. Snack Service knows that it is not Pilar's superior, but if Snack Service can't give Pilar that order, it means that Pilar needs to give Pilar that order. And then, having received that order, Pilar needs to trust that Pilar knew what she was doing and obey her. Pilar heads off in the direction of the rising sun and parallel to the distant coastline, as will bring her to Ostenso in time. It's strange to think that she can just walk through the forest like this, safely. She's been at Ostenso Academy full-time since she learned to hang Ray of Frost, which was the first point when it would have been even slightly sane to wander a short distance into a forest without being able to use a sword. Even as a second circle wizard, you wouldn't want to go that far into a forest on your own. A second circle just doesn't have the spell volume to deal with a medium-sized pack of predators. Now Pilar is a fifth circle oracle, who once slew out of hand a fourth circle security who was insolent to her, and it would be a very, very improbable encounter in this forest that brought her into conflict with anything scarier than herself. She is Cheliax's most valued spy-taker and would certainly be raised if slain, or true resurrected, if wholly devoured. It's not just that Pilar will almost certainly make it through the forest to Ostenso alive, it's that she can walk into the trackless depths of the forest without anxiety. The cold of night is just dissipating, the sun hardly even full above the horizon. Condensed dew sparkles on everything around her, dampens her when she brushes past branches and leaves. Pilar set up an endure elements when she hung spells before dawn this morning, but she holds off on casting it on herself. It's not that cold, and she can handle much worse than a little wet. The reason it's not an unprecedented experience for Pilar is that she also traipsed through a sunlit forest like this in Elysium, four months ago. She would rather not think about that, and orders herself not to. Aspexia Rugaton said that, though she hated it, she had to admit that Snack Service had helped Cheliax after all. Pilar is not going to act out angrily at Snack Service to the point of ignoring sensible suggestions like that, Pilar command herself to stop thinking for a time. She has, in fact, been doing one thing after another, or being in one kind of difficult situation or another, for quite a while now. 
It's sensible if the first step in whatever fate snack service has set up for her is to quiet her thoughts for a time. Stop thinking then, Pilar. Stop thinking. Just walk through the sunrise-lit forest getting damp and don't think about anything for a while. Some time has passed now. It might be an hour or two hours. The sun's higher, but Pilar has been deliberately not thinking about angles and seasons and what that means for how much time has probably passed. Her feet grew sore, and her legs, after some of that time. But Pilar cast lesser restoration on herself when she noticed herself beginning to slow, and continued. A hill stands before her, and Pilar deliberately goes up it, so she can check that her sunbearing is correct and hasn't taken her away from the coastline she's trying to parallel towards Ostenso. The coastline looks more distant to her left, but to Pilar's right, there's what looks like an unpaved road, with wheel ruts to show that carters travel along it. A road like that ought to be bearing toward Ostenso, Pilar thinks. And if not, or if she's about to get lost or late for anything important, snack service can stop her about it, right? Silence! Pilar angles towards the road. It's not just that Pilar is less delighted now by the sparkling leaf dew dampening her, she cast Endure Elements on herself when that started to be true, but that it's been four months since the last time she had a genuinely normal conversation with anybody. Road to Sherwin. The road is smooth dirt, unstoned and unpebbled, and still much easier to walk over than untamed forest ground. One obtains twice the speed for half the effort, walking on almost any road at all. Pilar's mind goes automatically to Asmodia's patient efforts to test the usability for road surfacing of common materials that would be easily found nearby in forests or in plains. Dampened, prestidigitated in various ways, with heavy rollers run over them after the dampening and prestidigation, looking for a surface that would last and shed water once solidified, looking for a way to make lasting roads cheaply with one first circle cleric to conjure water and a handful of wizard apprentices to prestidigitate it, Lay roads almost as fast as a heavy roller could roll, roads firm enough that Keltham's tricycles could be invented and set loose on them. Would Asmodia have saved tens of thousands of Chelish lives over the next year, as Snack Service did claim, through some other use that Asmodia had in a war with Osirian, or by her influencing Keltham somehow? Or is road-making just that important that quickly? Probably road-making is just that important. Too many people walking them, too many goods moving across them. Why did they mock Asmodia? What were they thinking? There can't be many more important matters than roads. Only, what good does it even do to Cheliax to know how to make cheap roads? If many people have to be taught the knowledge to make many roads cheaply, it can't be kept from Osirian, from other countries' spies. It wouldn't have helped Cheliax. Cheliax wouldn't have gained any advantage. It would only have helped the Chelish people. Pilar closes her eyes and walks blind for a minute along a straighter portion of the path. She doesn't need to think about such things right now. Pilar commanded her so. The road presents Pilar with her first carter, traveling the opposite way from Pilar. A woman with a narrow cloth-covered cart resting on wide wheels, drawn by a single ox. By the time the cart is drawn close enough that the woman's expression is readable, her face is very guarded. She has had time to see Pilar by then, of course, and maybe wonder to herself what an Ostenso wizard apprentice is doing on this road from Ostenso to who knows where. Pilar never did get herself into the habit of wearing clothes other than the uniform of Ostenso's wizard academy. It was something of an unofficial uniform among the old guard of Project Lawful, and an honorable one for that time. Igorian has learned to fear it, not least because of Pilar herself, and that city will have odd reflexes if some innocent Ostenso student somehow ends up visiting there. Am I on the road to Ostenso? Pilar calls to her once they're in easy hearing range. Who's asking? Pilar Pineda of Project Lawful, the Cake Girl, Cheliax's secret weapon and terror of Last Wall. That's probably not going to help here, is it? Jack May of Ostenso's Wizard Academy. Don't ask me why I'm here, or why I don't know if I'm on the right road. It's a long story, a private story, and you're welcome and encouraged to report on this event to any authority you deem appropriate. The woman measures Pilar as she passes, not slowing down her cart at all, showing no fear, though even a wizard apprentice is a dangerous creature to a commoner if it comes to battle. If you're on the right road, she says in a tired voice and passes on without saying aught else. Pilar, feeling sad and not really knowing why, trudges on. After a couple of minutes, she sighs and reaches up to her hair to press to digitate it a more ordinary color. There just aren't that many people who want to draw that particular attention to themselves.
pink-haired young woman in Ostenso Academy uniform is too identifying, even if you don't call yourself Pilar. Sometime later, several other carters have passed Pilar going the other direction from her, all with similar guarded expressions, and Pilar hasn't met a single cart going her own way. Pilar spends several embarrassing minutes speculating about whether carters are starting out from Ostenso at dawn, but carters who started out at dawn from wherever this road's other end goes are too far away to have caught up to her yet. Then Pilar actually visualizes the road in her mind, as though it were a spell she was analyzing. She realizes that obviously if Pilar is walking quickly in one direction, it's like the carters are moving very quickly in the opposite direction, relative to her while carters moving in her own direction are traveling more slowly, relative to her. Pilar slows down then and walks at a more relaxed pace to give the carters behind herself time to catch up. It's not too long afterward that Pilar hears a clopping sound approaching from behind herself. This cart is moving at a fair pace, as one might expect on priors would be overrepresented in carts overtaking Pilar. It's drawn by two horses instead of a single ox. The cart they draw is draped with hides washed but neither cured nor tanned, and bears also a barrel over full with fish. The man who steers the cart is large, muscular, bears a short sword at his hip. Hides like these are more valuable by the pound than produce. Hail the road, Pilar calls to the carter as he draws nearer her. Have you place for a traveler to Ostenso? You know, you'd tire the horses and my cargo is perishable. That means the price is higher. Not that you don't have a place available, Pilar says back before she quite remembers that not everyone thinks as Elani do. <laughs> sure. If you're willing to spend two silver on it, I'd let you ride up here until I judge the horses are slowing or breathing heavier. Then you're back on the road, but you'd have a rest of it anyways. Money in that amount means nothing to her anymore. Accepted. It's only then that Pilar realizes, just like a silly princess in a story, that most of her money is in platinum. Project Lawful in the old days didn't want Keltum seeing that chelish paper currency was backed in souls on the markets of Dis. Even the paper currency she does have isn't in denominations smaller than five gold. She reaches into her robes and finds a gold piece, as is, literally, the least valuable exchangeable thing she's carrying. Pilar waits until she's already on the cart to hand it over and ask him if he's got change. He's already wary and blank, and if this question produces any increase in wariness, it's not noticeable. I suppose he doesn't have change. What then, huh? Maybe I've been hanging out too much with the wrong crowd these last four months, but I can't help but think that the obvious thing to do would be for both of us to generate numbers between one and five, and if they're the same, you keep the gold piece, and otherwise, you give it back. One chance in five of a gold piece is equivalent to two silver. If that gets a short bark of laughter from him. I ain't matching wits with no wizard. And here I thought that you were matching wits with me when you asked what happened if you couldn't make change. Well, you could also promise me very seriously that you didn't have the ability to make change and gamble that I couldn't run Detect Thoughts to verify that. You look a bit young to be second circle. Thank you very much. Suppose I don't want to make change. I suppose I could take the gold piece back and just use a pair of lesser restorations on your horses when they got tired. You'd get to your destination even faster that way, I think. That's a cleric spell. Yep. You're dressed as a wizard apprentice. Yep. You want me to demonstrate prestidigitation wizard only or guidance cleric only? You only get to pick one, and I'll show you whichever one you pick, but not both. Why not both? Don't feel like it. And if I told you to get off my cart? Don't feel like that either. All right, how about you show me a guidance then? Sure thing. Pilar boops him with guidance. Huh, I can feel it, sort of. Ashamed to just waste it. How do we play the game where we pick numbers from one to five? I'm not exactly going to let you have second move. I could put some random number of coins from one to five in my hand, and then you say your number and I open my hand. Or we could do the reverse. Either's fine. Better hurry, though. The spell only lasts a minute if you don't use it. You're sure you put some coins in your hand, then? Pilar reaches into her uniform, takes out five platinum coins, and shuts her hand around those. Two. Nope. She opens her hand to show him the five platinum. Wealthy, aren't we? Yep. May I have my gold piece back? You did lose the game. Of course. He passes it back to her with a friendly smile. This isn't exactly a normal conversation, but it's fun, and... Honestly, this is more normal than any conversation Pilar has had in a while. At least that went on any longer than past the butter. Any interesting gossip in Ostenso? Says Pilar. 
Depends. What does somebody like you find interesting? Good question. Do you know whether or not there ultimately turned out to be any disguised ancient dragons hanging out in town, just in case Keltham passed them by? Sounds like I'm missing some gossip myself, actually. Well, it's known now that Keltham was somewhere around Ostenso before he left Cheliax, but not in Ostenso. So one of the speculations was that there would have been disguised powerful entities hanging out in Ostenso in case Keltham passed them by. Any mysterious powerful adventurers wander into town about four months ago and then suddenly disappear about five weeks ago? That'd be the indication there. Not that I know of. How boring. Well, do you know any gossip then? At this point in the conversation, he does not wish to give the appearance of needing to be asked twice. Sure, he knows some gossip about the state of things in Ostenso. What a normal conversation she's having. It's great. He'll eventually observe, in the tone of somebody who isn't drawing any inference from the fact, that the horses do look a little more tired to him now. Pilar will cheerfully hop off the cart and start walking again. He would, in fact, sell her a ride all the way to Ostenso for five platinum. Nah, she's had her rest. The carter drives off, doing a great job of not being too overt and glancing uneasily behind himself, nor giving too much visible sign that he's wondering how close he came to dying. It's strange that Pilar is thinking to herself that she was evil there and enjoyed it. Why should that be surprising? Pilar has been a faithful Asmodean all her life, hasn't she? That couldn't have happened that way in Elysium. The stakes wouldn't be real. The carter wouldn't be really scared. Why is Pilar surprised that part of herself would be sad if nothing like that ever happened again? If nobody got to be sadistic like herself or under real pressure like the carter? Pilar has always believed it would be terrible if everywhere was like Elysium. There'd be no place for Pilar there. It's not literally, but very nearly Pilar's first time enjoying being mean to somebody and not just enjoying other people being mean to her. That, that can't actually be. Pilar learned it from Carissa Savar. Pilar was cruel to the carter, but only after he started trouble and in a way that didn't break him and gave him a story to remember afterwards of how he was strong and handled himself well around a mysterious threat. Before Project Lawful, Pilar had only seen mean people who liked breaking things or were trying to act in a way that would look evil to others or to themselves, or who had excuses for doing things they enjoyed that other people weren't enjoying and that would not, in fact, make people any stronger. It is a very narrow path to walk, to find a way of lawful evil that isn't about being forced to cast acid splash on prisoners. Pilar had thought that snack service was playing a long game to make Pilar renounce evil. In the end, good and evil, law and chaos, are definitions made up by an ancient entity that didn't care very much about a lot of things that mortals do care about. Snack Service has never tried to steer Pilar towards becoming good or evil or lawful or chaotic or anything else but Pilar Pineda. Pilar walks on in silence towards Ostenso. She's gone back to not thinking about things. It seemed like a wise order to give Pilar. Some more carts pass Pilar on the road going the other way. No other carts pass Pilar going her own way until she reaches the city. It wasn't much further on at this point. Ostenso Irwain. Ostenso is a thoroughly walled city, and Pilar's road takes her to a well-guarded gate. Pilar doesn't feel like dealing with questions. She closes her eyes, blacks out, and finds herself inside the city. Ostenso's streets seem smaller somehow than they did when Pilar ran them as a child, before authority told her to become a wizard and Pilar obeyed. The streets seem smaller even than they did on cautious excursions from Ostenso Wizard Academy, not very long ago at all. Chaliax is a lawful country, and Ostenso a lawful city, but not so lawful that a wizard academy would reasonably let their apprentices out to wander the streets alone and unguarded and have no fear of misplacing them. It's not that the streets are safer. Pilar has always felt safe in Chaliax. There really isn't very much bad that can happen to her here, but they are less challenging in the ways that the world could have presented her with some little challenge before. There is a foreign sailor adventurer swaggering down the street in expensive leather armor with a blade at his belt and Pilar doesn't have to be clever to evade him and whatever little trouble he might bring. If he pointed his trouble at Pilar, she could laugh and dance along with him, and if he made too much trouble for her, he'd die. Ostenso's streets seem smaller, and it isn't really a mystery why they do. She should probably get something to wear that isn't an Ostenso wizard student's uniform. Here in Ostenso, it doesn't stand out too much, but a single, unescorted wizard apprentice is a slightly anomalous sight, even so. And outside Ostenso, it screams, Project Lawful, 
and maybe even specifically Pilar Pineda to those rare people who keep up on that sort of news. Does Snack Service has any comments on that? Pilar is here because Snack Service told her it was time to go. Pilar does not actually know what she's supposed to do next, or if she could use different clothing for it. Pilar should get high-quality but otherwise standard adventuring equipment for wizards! It'll be easier if Pilar gets a bag of holding first, though. The smallest available size of bag of holding tends to be pretty expensive, even by the standards of Pilar's new wealth level. Dare Pilar hope that Caden Kylian is paying for this? He sure will, sort of. Turn left at the street intersection up ahead. Pilar is... Okay, she just dared to think pleasantly surprised, and now has a feeling she should not have dared think that. But perhaps she will be pleasantly surprised again by the consequences. Pilar turns left, and then right, and then right, and then left again, following Snack Service's directions. Say what you like about Ostenso, nobody could possibly accuse the street layout of being boring. Then Pilar will come at last to an abandoned-looking shack wedged between two rows of dirty cottages, near the outskirts of the town furthest from the water and docks. Not quite wedged up against the city walls, but near to them. Snack Service needs to run this part if Pilar can yield her body for a bit. Don't worry, Snack Service won't do anything with Pilar's body that doesn't ultimately serve Asmodeus's interests. Hopefully, Pilar has now seen some amount of evidence about that. All right, Pilar will hand her reins to Snack Service temporarily. Snack Service lifts up Pilar's hand and knocks on the door of the shack. Not hard. Eventually, as if some process was taking place that took a lot longer than come to the door of a tiny shack, the shack door opens and a scarred tiefling girl in a ragged maid uniform looks out from behind the door. Her gaze is not a friendly one. Hi! Snack Service says in a super cheerful, perky version of Pilar's voice, Do I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Doomlord's maidservant? Oh no. What do you want? The tiefling girl says in a harsh, low voice after the sort of pause that might be associated with somebody making a quick but obvious deduction. I want a bag of holding, and I want you to put inside five thousand gold pieces and three of your leftover divine plane shift scrolls and the bracers of shadow armor you've got an inventory that none of you are really going to need and a scroll of blah 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 blah. Holy shit, that's expensive, blah 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 blah, and I want you to not tell Mr. Doomlord about it. Uh-huh, out of pure grim curiosity if I asked for a reason I was doing that. I'd say that if you did it, you'd get this delicious cookie. The scarred tiefling girl takes the cookie without changing her distantly angry expression and eats it without changing her expression much either. Fine, she says after a pause. I suppose a cookie like that is worth that much of Doomlord stuff. Hold on while I go fetch it. She shuts the shack door on them. Pilar is torn between asking, what really just happened there, and who's Doomlord? But on concerned reflection, Pilar is going to ask the second question first, because the answer to that may influence how loudly Pilar needs to mentally scream the first question. Mr. Doomlord is a true neutral entity from outside Galarian's plane. Mr. Doomlord didn't come to Ostenso hoping to run across Keltum. He's here because of the divine non-intervention zone. This seems like the sort of important fact that Pilar should possibly be reporting to her superiors in Agorian. The negotiations for Mr. Doomlord coming here were mostly carried out with Asmodeus and Ottomans, but Contessa Lirilatha has been informed and isn't allowed to tell anybody else. Also, the negotiation ended up with Ottomans telling Asmodeus that Asmodeus wasn't allowed to look directly in Mr. Doomlord's direction, or at anybody around Mr. Doomlord in the place he was dwelling, and Asmodeus agreed to that, so Pilar shouldn't pray to him about it either. Pilar is actually going to have some trouble screaming loudly enough to do this situation justice. The shack door eventually opens and shows the scarred tiefling maid again, now bearing a bag of holding, which she hands over to Pilar and snack service still without much of an expression. You got something I'm supposed to say to Doomlord if he notices the anomaly in inventory? I don't think he'll notice before things reach a point where it'll be obvious to him what happened. But if he does, you can just say that you gave it away for a cookie. Also, here you should probably have these on hand around the place. Snack Service slings Pilar's student book bag off Pilar's shoulder, undoes the thief-resistant layers of buttoned flaps, and takes out the two headbands. Pilar's hand freezes on the hell-wrought lesser artifacts as she realizes what Snack Service is doing. Serves as Modius, and is kind of important, actually. Pilar, with some effort, allows Snack Service to control her body enough to hand the two headbands to the scarred tiefling. Huh, those look expensive. You got instructions to go with them? Don't let anybody else see them until you see Mr. Doomlord strutting about with his fancy new artifact. After that, I'm sure you can figure out what to do. The plus six, six plus four headband is on indefinite loan, but we'll need the plus four plus six plus six back after the trip to the city of Brass, which we'll be joining you on. 
And then we get the treatment that Mr. Doomlord plans for himself once we're there. You can consider that the price of the headband's loan, I suppose. Though really I just call it being mutually friendly about a matter of mutual interest. Also, after that trip, besides taking the second headband back, we'll want a couple hundred of big shinies from Mr. Doomlord's hoard, just in case we end up needing those on hand. Sounds like the sort of thing that key people will agree to. Any else? Well, don't tell anyone about this part, but matters have gone sort of weird and unpredictable, so we might turn up at any point screaming about something you need to do right away. Hopefully not, though. And that's all? The tiefling maid actually does smile at that. Pleasure doing business with you, she says, and shuts the shack's door. mentally scream loudly enough to do the situation justice and there's no point in trying fair what next then that was a pretty fast recovery pilar has now been a project lawful girl for several months well next pilar goes to the ostenso market and buys some other adventuring equipment that mr doomlord didn't have on hand and then pilar goes on adventures just like those she's heard tell of in legend pilar is not completely disinterested in or unhappy about this but Pilar hopes that she is not being asked to do things the same way as the adventurers of legend. Pilar thinks that the way legendary adventurers did things was stupid. Pilar has thought this ever since she was a little girl. Pilar is totally welcome to try doing things Pilar's own way. Right. What's first up, then? How would Pilar feel about going to the former Chelish city of Corvosa, which is still on good terms with Cheliax, and preventing its inhabitants from being horribly sacrificed in somebody's mad blood ritual seeking immortality? Sure. Can Snack Service tell Pilar who's going to do it, and then Pilar can sweep in with an army company and 20 high-level adventurers and kill them? Snack Service both won't and can't be any more specific than what Snack Service has said already. Cool. Pilar's going to find whoever's in charge of the city, identify herself honestly to them, and tell them a self-fulfilling prophecy about how they're going to successfully prevent their city from being sacrificed. Then... Instead of trying to do everything herself, Pilar is going to solve the problem in full cooperation with the authorities, obeying any reasonable orders they give her along the way. Pilar can totally try that and see what happens. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash askwhocastsai. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.